of my staff, I asked them what kind of music I should come on to, and they said, the theme to Darth Vader. <laughs> should I worry about that? So I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking, who is this guy and what is he doing here? So I thought I would address that for you today, tell you how I got to be here, and maybe a couple of lessons that I learned along the way, which may be useful to you as well. So it all started in kindergarten. Actually, it started before kindergarten, but for the purpose of the story, it's going to start in kindergarten. And I distinctly remember sitting with a group of four-year-olds in a circle, and a science teacher came in, science teacher for the big kids, and he brought with him a cow's heart. And he held this cow's heart up to show us. And while all the other kids were retching and screaming, I was completely transfixed by this thing with all these chambers and flaps. And it was at that moment, and I distinctly remember this, it was at that moment that I decided that I wanted to be a scientist because science is really cool. And that perhaps is the most important thing I can convey to anyone is that science is an amazing thing to be doing and we're very lucky to be able to do it. So from there, I was very lucky to have a number of really fantastic teachers, both in elementary school uh, and also in high school. You'll notice I leave out middle school, the dark tunnel of adolescence. <laughs> because like many, probably most of you, I did not have maybe quite as good a time in middle school. What I remember in middle school most is weighing lots of little things like paper clips. And I learned that weighing things is actually not that interesting. But in elementary school, I had Tom Snyder as a, as a science teacher who was amazing. Um, he actually went on to start one of the first educational software companies in the world and became a multimillionaire. But before that, he uh, really inspired and taught me. Then in high school, I had Richard Robinson as a chemistry teacher and Bruce Mole as a physics teacher. And these three guys was that they had the ability to explain complex things with extraordinary, uh, extraordinary clarity. And that's something I've always aspired to, uh, to try to emulate as well. They also taught with stories. So rather than try to cram facts into our heads and make us memorize things and regurgitate them, they told us stories about why science was amazing and why it fit into uh, something that we should be interested in. And finally, they all shared a sense of humor. Um, I think science is at times uh, not just amazing and cool, but can be very funny. Uh, and they were able to um, really get that across to us as well. And that made learning science um, something that uh, I was even more passionate about. I then went to college, and I again was lucky to have a number of great professors, uh, teachers, and mentors. And two of the most important are shown here, Judy Voet. Uh, a biochemist, was my biochemistry professor uh, and also one of my mentors for my thesis, uh, as was Nancy Hamlet, a microbiologist. And some of you may know Judy Voet's name if you were uh, taking biochemistry course and used the textbook Voet and Voet. She's one half of the Voets. Um, Nancy, as a microbiologist, spent much of her time uh, during the summers going to sewage treatment plants and other delightful sewage contaminated locations. And what she did there was to try to isolate bacteria that had interesting and resilient properties. And one of the bacteria that she isolated from a contaminated salt marsh in Cape Cod had the property of being highly resistant to mercuric ion. So um, instead of dying when exposed to high concentrations of mercuric ion, it seemed to thrive. And so Nancy reasoned that it probably had an enzyme called a mercuric reductase that could actually reduce mercuric iron uh, to metallic mercury. And metallic mercury actually has a high vapor pressure and can uh, leave the organism in peace and go off into the atmosphere. And so my job was to try to purify this mercuric reductase enzyme. And I spent many, many hours working in the lab in the cold room, pouring columns, growing bacteria, breaking them open uh, to try to purify this enzyme. Now, I had the great pleasure yesterday of talking to a number of you at your posters uh, and saw all the amazing work that you did uh, and you've been doing. And I can say it's much better than the work I did as an undergraduate. Um, but I know that sometimes science seems frustrating and you think, can I really get there? Am I gonna ever get this result? And am I ever gonna be able to say publish 
the work I've been doing. Um, but I just want to put this in perspective for you. So I did this work that I just told you about in the late 1980s, okay? Just a couple of years ago, my work was published in a journal, okay? 23 years in the making. So you can see my name, and one of the authors on this paper published in 2013 in a real journal. Um, that may be a world record, I'm not sure. But hopefully, uh, it gives you some hope that at least uh, it probably won't take you as long as it took me to publish your thesis work. What I learned from Judy and Nancy, uh, among the things I learned from them, were to study the literature, right? Um, there are a lot of things already known. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Study the literature, learn what's already been done, uh, and work from there. Work hard, that sounds trite, but at the core, that's uh, essentially uh, essential and important. If my teenage daughters were here, they'd be rolling their eyes right now, right? Come on, Dad, not again. But that, that is uh, something I tell them over and over again and really is um, critical. You can't get very far unless you work hard. Don't get discouraged. It took me 23 years to get my thesis research published, and yet here I am. And have fun doing science. Judy and Nancy had this incredible ability to, even when things weren't working the way we wanted to in the lab, always make it fun. Uh, and it was the process when you were working with them, not as much as the goal or the, the outcome, but the process that was important. From there, because of my interest in enzymology, I went on to a graduate school to work with this man, Jeremy Knowles, who was a world famous enzymologist. Those of you who have studied the metabolic enzyme triose phosphate isomerase and have learned that it's a perfect enzyme because the rate of its reaction is limited by the rate of diffusion, have this man to thank for that because he was the one that figured that out. And I worked really hard in my rotation in graduate school and he accepted me into his lab. Uh, and I remember walking down the hallway once following behind Jeremy and he stopped at one of those big posters that he had up in the hallway that showed all the different enzymatic pathways that were known. And he stood there and stared at it for what seemed like 20 minutes. And I started to wonder, you know, had he blown a gasket? What was happening here? <laughs> and finally he turned to me and he looked at me and he said, and he had this beautiful Oxford English accent, he said, John, there are so many interesting enzymes. And he's right. I mean, it's just amazing what's out there. And so that was one of the things I learned from Jeremy, that there are an enormous number of not just interesting enzymes, but fascinating questions in all of science, right? And so sometimes you probably open your textbook and you think, oh, it's all been figured out. What am I doing? But we haven't even scratched the surface of what's out there. The amazing things that are yet to be discovered and yet to be understood uh, is truly extraordinary. And I think that you, you are going to be the ones uh, that figure those things out and make those new discoveries. And I'm really excited to be able to watch you do that. I also learned from Jeremy that communication is key. It's too bad that he passed away before the era of YouTube really got started because this man could give a talk like no one else I ever saw. He was hilariously funny and extraordinarily lucid just like those science teachers I had in elementary and high school. Finally, working with Jeremy taught me to capitalize on change and unplanned opportunities. And why is that? Well, that's because two months after I joined Jeremy's lab, he called me in and he said, John, I'm becoming dean of the faculty, and so you have to find a new lab, right? And I was devastated. This is why I went to graduate school here. This is who I wanted to work for. Interestingly, De Jeremy didn't just say, go find the new lab. He actually told me whose lab I was going to join. And I was luckily sensible enough. The one sensible thing I did was to listen to him. Okay? And Jeremy sent me, with no choice, to work for this man, Jack Shostak. You know, some of you may have heard of Jack. Jack won the Nobel Prize a few years ago in medicine uh, for not work that I had anything to do with. Uh, but work he did before I got there, looking at how the ends of chromosomes, telomeres, get replicated. Jack is, to put it bluntly, a genius, a visionary. And he thinks of things that no one else imagined was even possible. And not only does he imagine them, he tries them. And then he makes them work. And so when I was in Jack's lab, what we were working on was 
to try to understand the possible chemical properties of RNA, right? And he thought RNA could probably do things well beyond the roles that were known. And so he synthesized pools of random sequence RNAs, 10 to the 15th or more RNA molecules. And then we tried to select from those pools of RNAs molecules that had specific properties. For instance, they would, might bind to ATP or some other molecule, or they might catalyze a reaction, like transferring a phosphoryl group from ATP to something else, right? And it sounded crazy, it still sounds crazy. People thought he was nuts, but the thing is, it worked, right? And we were actually able to find all kinds of enzymes and binding properties in these pools of RNA, which have gone on to be important in drug discovery, in biotechnology, and tell us important things about the possible origins of life, okay? So this amazing, crazy idea uh, really turned out to be true. That's a picture of Jack when he first started his lab. And so that tells you, don't judge a book by its cover. So what I learned from Jack, I learned think big and bold, right? Science is incredibly fun, it's incredibly cool, but it's hard, right? And if you're going to take the time and the trouble to start a career in science and to work at it, you might as well work on something important and really uh, interesting that has potential to do something big. Be interested in everything. Jack was interested in everything from economics to neuroscience and everything in between. And he would devote you know, immense amounts of time to studying these various things. And it proved important in all kinds of different and unexpected ways. Okay, so just try to be as interested as you can in everything. Uh, don't limit yourself to a single specific area. Capitalize on change and unplanned opportunities, right? I ended up in Jack's lab because Jeremy Knowles became dean of the faculty unexpectedly and kicked me out, right? Um, and it turned out to be one of the greatest things in my life and launched me uh, on the rest of my career. So it's unlikely you're going to go in a straight line. Uh, use those diversions as opportunities. I then went to do a postdoc to work with uh, this guy, Dan Hirschlag, who was an RNA biochemist and enzymologist. That's where I got interested in not just studying a single enzyme or a single RNA, but very complex collections of molecules, complex systems. And the system that I chose to study was protein synthesis in eukaryotes. And so here's a figure showing you protein synthesis in eukaryotes. Write it down, because we're going to quiz you afterwards about the whole thing. Uh, but I've spent the rest of my career, my scientific career, studying how all of these components come together, assemble a ribosome on a messenger RNA, let it find the appropriate place to start making the, the corresponding protein. And how does it do this all the time with tremendous accuracy? And so that's what my lab has spent the last 15 or so years studying. What I learned from Dan was two things. Dan had a very rigorous biochemical training, and he taught me to think rigorously. So even in a very complex system like this with all these different factors and components, you can think very rigorously and quantitatively about it. And by doing so, you can really get, gain deep insights. Dan also taught me the importance of questioning your assumptions and your conclusions. Okay, Dan was a very, is a very critical guy. Now, being confident is important, but I think being uh, someone who questions one's assumptions, questions whether or not your conclusions are right, is equally important. And that's critical in science, right? We don't want to become convinced that our hypotheses are true. The best scientists are the ones who are trying the hardest to prove themselves wrong. And that was something really important that uh, Dan taught me as well. Now, then from there, I went on to get a job on the faculty at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, and you might think, well, that's the end of your need of mentors. Now you've made it, you're on your own. Uh, but that wasn't true at all. And instead, um, I found that I needed mentors more than ever because I didn't know what I was doing as a faculty member. Uh, and I needed to develop all kinds of new talents and get all kinds of guidance. And I was lucky to have a number of great mentors there. A couple of them are shown here. One was Jeremy Berg, who was the chair of the department. and uh, He was the one who hired me. Ironically, he left Hopkins a few years after I got there and is my predecessor as director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. The other was David Nichols, who is shown on the other side. David is a critical care pediatrician, 
um, and was vice dean for education at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Together, they taught me a number of different important things, including that one needs should be calm uh, but tenacious. So you can see your goal, where you want to get. Uh, you want to change things. You want to make things better. And you're frequently going to run into roadblocks. Um, but just because the first time you try, uh, people put up roadblocks and you don't get where you want to go, doesn't give you license to give up. And instead, what they taught me was you need to keep trying and be tenacious if you know that that goal is where you want to get. Um, that's what you want to achieve. But you shouldn't get upset. Um, you should be calm and just keep working towards um, the end point. They also taught me to build relationships and play to other people's strengths and how important that was to getting, uh, to achieving the things you wanted to achieve. David Nichols once told me that his biggest strength was that he had a very high tolerance for very weird people, okay? <laughs> and all of you students out there know from working with your faculty mentors and other faculty that there are a lot of weird people out there, right? <laughs> right? But you gotta be able to work with them and you gotta play to their strengths because everyone has strengths and you gotta be able to work past their oddities, okay? And that's something they taught me. And finally, they both taught me that you may find that you love doing things that you had no idea you would like doing. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I got to Hopkins, I thought that all I was going to be doing was doing research. That's what I wanted to do. But very quickly, Jeremy Berg, my chair, threw me in the deep end of the teaching pool. He threw me into a small group room full of first year medical students and said, go teach them biochemistry. Okay, you want to know fear, that's fear. What did I find out? Despite the fact I thought this was not anything I wanted to do, I very quickly discovered that I loved teaching. I had a passion for teaching, okay? And through this teaching, which I became increasingly involved in, I actually also found that I liked administration and leadership. And so when Jeremy Berg left, I actually took over his job running this course for medical students. From there, I became director of the whole first year medical curriculum. I then got involved in reforming the medical curriculum, and then we're trying to reform the graduate PhD curriculum as well. Um, from there, I took over the role of running uh, the graduate uh, curriculum, uh, the graduate enterprise, the committee that oversees graduate education at Hopkins. And from there, I started to do work in the provost's office, right? This is what led me to take the job at NIGMS um, as director of, of an institute at NIH, all because I found out that I loved to teach, which was something I didn't know. So then I got to NIH, and you'd think again, well, maybe that's the end. You don't need mentors anymore. You figured it out. But of course, that's not true at all. And still, I need mentors. Still, I have many great mentors. My mentors range from people like my boss, Francis Collins, who you can see there, the singing scientist. If you've never seen him sing and play guitar, please search for him on YouTube, Francis Collins singing. Uh, it'll be worth it, I guarantee it. Francis has taught me many important things, um, including a great uh, saying he just told me, which was, you know you're getting over the target when you start taking flack. Okay, something to think about. Larry Tayback is the number two person at NIH. Um, he's the principal deputy director. Taught me everything you can imagine about how to work in the government, how to get things done, how to run an institute, how to work with other institutes. Griff Rogers is my formal mentor that I was assigned when I got to uh, NIH. Uh, he's the director of the National Institute of Diabetes, uh, Digestive, and Kidney Disorders. He's taught me how uh, one can manage change and, and get things done at the NIH. Informal mentor, Tony Fauci, director of the Allergy and Infectious Diseases Institute, taught me how to deal with complex, difficult situations. Whenever I have a problem, I go to Tony, and Tony knows about problems. If you were paying attention during the Ebola outbreak, Tony, more than anyone else, I would say, is the person who uh, brought that under control. And finally, Judith Greenberg, okay? Judith is actually my deputy, so she works for me. And yet she has a tremendous amount of experience at the NIH uh, and knows how to get things done. She continually mentors me in how to more effectively get things done in that environment. And so the key point here is that mentors can be your superiors, and that's how you tend to think of them, your faculty, other faculty, et cetera. 
They could be your colleagues, other students for you, in my case, other institute directors. They can also be your subordinates, right? Judith Greenberg works for me, uh, and yet she's taught me a tremendous amount about running an institute. Okay, so just in closing, what are the general principles here? First of all, and this is obvious, you've heard it over and over again at this meeting, find great mentors, okay? It could be your professor, it could be somebody else, but a key point, right, is that uh, mentor up and down. You will be mentored by people above you. As I said, you should be mentored by your colleagues, but you can even be mentored by people below you. And given that, you should be mentoring both below you to younger students, but also above you, okay? Your mentors, other faculty have a tremendous amount they can learn from you and your perspective um, from where you sit as a student or a trainee. Did I learn to teach from my senior colleagues when I was learning to teach at Hopkins? No. I learned to teach from the students. That's who taught me how to teach effectively, um, not from my colleagues. Now, where can you get mentoring help? Of course, you know, a meeting like this is a great place. I hope, though, uh, you heard David Burgess talk earlier about the National Research Mentoring Network. I'd like everybody in this room to go to this website and sign up to be either a mentor or a mentee. Um, I think this is going to be a great thing. They're going to match the mentors and mentees. There's going to be structured mentoring, and hopefully that will build lifelong relationships. Find something you love to do. That sounds trite. People say it all the time, but it's so true. Right? If you don't like something, you're not going to be passionate about it. Science is incredibly fun, um, and I hope you agree with me on that. Bring that uh, excitement and that joy to what you do. It's also important to remember that you can contribute to science in many different ways. Um, you can go into research, and that's great. We certainly hope you will. But if research is not what you end up doing, you can still contribute to this enterprise in lots of different and important ways. Be interested in everything and everyone. I said that before. I can't tell you how many times being interested in something that someone was telling me that was different from my normal day-to-day -day thinking eventually became important to me, either the facts they were telling me the principles, or the relationship that I built through that interest. And finally, embrace unexpected opportunities and paths, right? Your career is very unlikely to follow a linear path. There are going to be twists, there are going to be turns, but use those twists and turns as opportunities to go up a level rather than as challenges. So I thank you uh, and very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you.